in the last 18 months alone, you know, we've we basically redeployed our entire point of sale. We've deployed smart scanning and mobile pay. We're really pushing the boundary, I think, in terms of the digital customer experience. Technology is the business. I actually think we're going to see CEOs come from the CIO, CTO family. I think we're going to see more businesses be led by career technologists. Make sure you know the business as well as everybody else does. It's less about technology and much more about the application of it in your business. I'm drawn to change, so mm -hmm. I, wherever I go, transformation it ends up being a huge theme. I'm just a big believer in transparency and honesty. You know, transparency drives speed in a business. This is here on TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Phil Jordan, who is the group CIO of uh, Sainsbury's. A very warm welcome, uh, Phil. Thanks, Hendrik. Great to be here. Phil has more than 30 years of experience in our industry, and he's worked as a CIO for companies such as AXA, uh, Vodafone, O2, Telefonica, and now for the last three years, Phil, you are the group CIO of Sainsbury. And that, of course, is the company that's the UK's second largest retailer with over 1,400 uh, stores. So, Phil, could you um, give us a bit of context in a nutshell? Who is it that you are? What's your background? And how did you arrive in this uh, position as a group CIO? Yeah, good morning. I mean, yeah, I'm a career, career IT technology leader, I guess. I mean, I've, I've worked in telecoms for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. but came up through from, from working in IT to, to lead IT teams and ultimately lead, lead technology functions and uh, became CIO for Vodafone and I've spent time, like I say, in telco and now in retail. So mm -hmm. a career technology guy, Hendrik, can come up through the, the ranks really of IT uh, to lead, lead, for the, lead the function. Okay, and for those of you who don't know the company, could you uh, in a nutshell explain what is Sainsbury and what is it really good at? Yeah, we're a, I mean, we're a group of businesses. I mean, primarily our main business is Sainsbury's, which is, uh, which is a grocery supermarket business. As you mm -hmm. say, one of the big four in the UK, second biggest retailer in the UK. But we also have Argos, which is a, a general merchandise business. And we have a bank as well, uh, Sainsbury's okay. Bank. And then we augment that all with, we, we run Nectar, which is the UK's largest loyalty uh, affiliate program. So they all come together as, and make us a sort of multi-brand, multi-channel retail business. Okay, great. So Phil, you have worked on a couple of big transformations, uh, both in your last job at Telefonica and now at Sainsbury's. Could you describe a little bit uh, the transformations that you have worked on in, uh, in these organizations? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I'm drawn to change. So mm -hmm. I, wherever I go, transformation it ends up being a huge theme, I think. As you, as you say, Telefonica was a, a, a major multi-country digitization of, of the business. Uh, and mm -hmm. then latterly in Sainsbury's, we've been really driving a, a, much, uh, a much bigger focus on data. So digitization, of course, but yep. pulling right the way through into a real insight and data-driven transformation, really recognizing that as a business, you know, we, we have a tremendous amount of data about how the UK population lives their life and really mm -hmm. turning that into insight and action. So, so two major transformations, both you know, digital at the heart, but digital and data becoming really, really crucial for Sainsbury's. And so at, at Telefonica, what was, the, what was the biggest challenge in that transformation that you had to uh, overcome? Yeah, I suppose the biggest challenge at Telefonica was, first of all, getting the business to recognize that we needed to change. Uh -huh. I think, you know, large incumbent business, very successful, you know, that urgency and that need to transform took, took a while really for, for us to sort of to explain that, I think, to the business and, and, and have the business really want to lead a business change enabled by technology. And then obviously the next challenge was making sure that the way we ran it was very business-led um, because we're really talking about changing the business model of a telecoms business back in, uh, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, really looking to drive integration of the product, you know, fixed line, mobile, TV, and, and reinvent really process and system capability for a, for a new age, for a digital age. Yeah. So I suppose the biggest challenge was, was, was recognizing the need, first of all. And then mm -hmm. we got into all the other challenges of actually driving 20, you know, changing concurrently in 20 countries uh, and basically replacing the entire process and system landscape. So it was a, 
significant challenge, and particularly for a for a Brit in a Spanish business, you know, <laughs> trying to lead that sort of change was a cultural challenge as well. Uh, okay. And Sainsbury's is more is more about you know it's a single country, but a very intensely trading business. 30, you know, 30 million customers a week, and, and trying to shift customer, you know, to try to meet customer demand, but shift customer behavior to becoming more digital and data driven, you know, mm -hmm. is still an ongoing challenge for us. Because retail business is under high pressure to change, right? I mean, you have all the, the, the online retailers that are taking, taking away your business. So, so how can a, a big company, I mean, with the traditional, uh, I would say, big companies don't necessarily change quickly. So, so how can you make sure that when there is online retailers that are grabbing your business, how you can make sure that you have that you make the necessary changes in a big company like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're a big business. We've been around for 150 years uh, okay. wow. as a business. So, you know, in, in one sense, you you think, well, you know, that's a business that's difficult to change. Actually, we've been innovative from our. It's in our DNA. You know, we were okay. set up by the original Sainsbury's family um, to create healthy butter to feed mm -hmm. uh, inner city London uh, people. And if you look through our history, you know, we were the first to have checkouts, the first to go self-service. The, so there's something, and our, and our food product's very innovative. So I think there's something really innovative in our DNA. And I think sometimes it's wrong to, to see a, an older business or a bigger business and think it can't be innov innovative. And I think in the last 18 months alone, you know, we've, we've basically redeployed our entire point of sale. We've deployed smart scanning and mobile pay. You know, we're, we're really pushing the boundary, I think, in terms of the digital customer experience that people can expect mm -hmm. when they go into a, into a superstore. So I, I think actually we're a lot more innovative as a business than perhaps people give us credit for. But of course, I think part of the job of the CIO, I think, is to, is, is to be able to really engage in that dialogue with the business about the art of the possible and reimagining the business using technology differently. And I have to say, I found Sainsbury's to be very ready to change, you know, really willing okay. to change and ready to change. And I think it's because, as you say, there's so much pressure to change. You know, mm -hmm. it's either being, you know, at the low end being sort of disintermediated by the discounter businesses, Audi and Lidl, in, if you know mm -hmm. the UK market. Yeah. And obviously at the top end, general merchandise, we have Amazon, you know, very, very much toe to toe with Amazon. So, you know, the competitive threat is really clear. And I think mm -hmm. that's created a really, um, a really interesting opportunity for change. And actually, I think if you think of this year alone, you know, COVID coming along as it has is another massive catalyst for change. So, yep. you know, I think that, you know, the, the sort of stars have aligned for real change in our sector. And, and I think we're at the forefront of it. Okay, so you would say that Sainsbury really has a culture of, uh, of, of change and transformation and innovation? Sainsbury's is a big business that's made up of a number of cultures, I think. You know, it's, it's born by acquisition and, um, uh, you know, we've put some bits and bobs together to make up a group of businesses. And like any group, mm -hmm. I'm sure anybody watching this who, who works in a group context will know typically one culture doesn't pervade the whole business. But okay. I think on the whole, we're a, we're a very customer-centric business. And mm -hmm. I think because customer trends have accelerated so fast this year, I think there's a real ambition, collective ambition to, to drive change in the business, particularly mm -hmm. I think customer facing, customer front end. You know, we need to do more really to go end to end digital and really think about our back end. You know, we have a very complex, you know, multi-country supply chain, very complex international logistics. And there's mm -hmm. more to do there, there's more to do there. But I think culturally, I think because customers are demanding change, I think culturally we're we're open to it, yeah, yeah, and we certainly invest. I mean, for a, a two percent margin business, which is what we are, <laughs> which is if you if you stop and think about a two percent margin, yeah. you know, we 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 invest heavily in technology, which I think is a testament to our ambition. Okay, now many of your competitors and also, I mean, banks and telco companies are becoming more and more ecosystems and platform companies. Is that also a strategy for Sainsbury's? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, I think it's probably a strategy for every technology business, isn't it? I mean, I think, you, you know, we're almost in this paradigm where the how easily you are to partner with it becomes a differentiator for you. And, you know, certainly when, even when I was at Telefonica and I have brought the thinking into Sainsbury's is, you know, I think there's a, a real shift in IT, you know, where mm -hmm. the T becomes more commoditized over time, doesn't it? But the I, you know, information, innovation, integration... If you think about that in the partner and a platform context, you know, I, I used to use the phrase IT to I3. Are we going to see this shift away from a commoditizing of the T in IT and a real explosion in the I? Uh, and mm -hmm. certainly, again, we, we've worked really hard at information, innovation and integration as, as three key pillars 
of how to become a platform business. And a great example, you know, would be, you know, Amazon Marketplace is a great example of a, of a retail ecosystem. Yep. And we operate a similar ecosystem. And obviously our opportunity okay. is, is bring, bring as many sellers to as many buyers as possible. And that's kind mm -hmm. of the core of a retail business. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the the the, the processes. I mean, in in transformation, you have um, you need to have an an, an innovative culture, an open culture for uh, for transformation. You also need the processes and then the technology. Let's talk about processes. How do you? What kind of processes did you have to implement over the last couple of years in in, in your team to uh, to facilitate the the change and the transformation that the company is going through? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, there's two aspects to process, isn't there? There's one is the, the business process, and I'll come back uh -huh. to that. But in terms of the technology team and the IT teams across the business, mm -hmm. we've certainly, we've integrated all the brands together. First thing we did was recognize that customers, you know, they come in through the brand, but we don't necessarily have to be siloed to the brand. So we've basically created a one business that's multi-channel, multi-brand. Okay. And we worked really hard at, at at flipping the model to become a scale, entirely scale agile model. So mm -hmm. we work as a product company now. So, uh, you know, there's 16 product families in IT. Uh, they, they work with long standing teams. We don't run projects anymore. We, we allocate investment into a product area on a half yearly basis. And then we really delegate the authority to the heads of engineering in my team and the heads of the sponsors from the business to decide how do you allocate that resource and that funding to, is it feature mm -hmm. building on a product or a backlog or dealing with technical debt? So, so I, think, I think we're unusual now because I think we, our, our entire business works like that. So I have, okay. I have two CTOs and they just have product families um, and, and we've moved completely away from what I would call a traditional project-based approach. And that's mm -hmm. really worked for us. It's really engaged the business in a different way. It's, okay. it's, it's really increased our speed of execution. And probably the most important thing is it, it's increased our return on investment. We've seen benefits escalate considerably, you know, over the last, you know, 12, 24 months, really. We've seen a real step on in terms of the return on investment from technology spend. But we so, had to do some really bold things, Andrew. I'll finish off. It just one of the things I inherited was that we had a project-based investment model still, but a yep. product-based operating model. And mm -hmm. we had to basically change the investment. So I had to get my business and the CFO and the, my boss to to really change and, and have a different level of thinking on IT investment. So like I said, we mm -hmm. moved away from project by project justification to product areas being funded on a half yearly basis and pushing a lot more empowerment out to, to the heads of engineering who work in, in, my, in my team. And it's really so worked for us. So you've completely changed the governance, governance model yeah. as well of, 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 of yeah. all the, the, the products that you're working on. Yeah. Yeah, completely oh, changed. Okay. I mean, it's it's night and day. But but I think, if, and maybe other people listening will have this problem that you know, if you have an operating model that works, you know, broadly along scale agile terms, mm -hmm. but your investment model is still you know stuck in <laughs> ten year old, yeah. it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. we've just found it's really worked for us. Not everywhere. Mm -hmm. Some some parts, some product families, some parts of my business, some parts of my technology function. Are, are better at that partnership with the business than others. But mm -hmm. it becomes very apparent very quickly where the partnership okay. really works. And particularly for digital for us, it's worked really and, well. And that change came from, from you, from, from the IT department, that, that new operating model. And, and how was that accepted to the business? I mean, how do you implement a model like that? Because people like typically like the way that things are and just want to do it quicker and faster yeah. and cheaper. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we're very lucky that we have a, have a very good head of finance who works with, into my area, obviously part of the finance mm -hmm. organization. And we could both see the challenge we were facing in having an operating mm -hmm. model that, was, that, was, that demanded one way of behaving and, and performing and an investment model that, that was almost counterintuitive to that. So we, yeah. we, we, des we, we designed it, we, we put it into an organization, we experimented inside our team, we took one product family and experimented. And we proved, I think, over the course of sort of four or five months that we could see increased levels of empowerment, increased levels of accountability, but most important, that return on investment creeping up because people felt very you know, emotionally connected to, to the use of technology, not just the delivery of it. And I think mm -hmm. this is one of the differences. It's, you know, it's not, it, it, I think we typically, traditionally, are very focused on up to the delivery, but it's not really the delivery, it's what you do with it. It's the change yep. of effect in the business. And this model really focuses on 
almost post-delivery, what do you do with the technology once it's delivered? So, you know, and we, um, the business was very happy to, to try it. And we tried it and we experimented and then we rolled it out. And we've been doing, we've been running like that now for 18 months. Okay, and great. Um, yeah, we won't go back. And also, and so you would say that your teams that work that way are happier teams than, than teams that still work on more in a project uh, way? Yeah, I mean, we, we, yeah, definitely. Because I think what, you know, if you think about what's in it for everyone, if you, the heads of engineering, the guys who are delivering, girls who are delivering for me, um, they're not, they're not in this world where they have to allocate resource on, on a, on a project life cycle basis. You know, they can build a long running team. They can build capability in that team. They, you know, they have more empowerment to what that team does. You know, is it yeah. fixing technical debt? Is it, adding feature. So they feel a lot more in control. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the business feels like they've got their own technology department on a product by product basis. So they, yep. they know where to go. They work with a product area. Um, and we're going to go a little bit further, actually. I mean, we're going to go further and into DevOps in that world and, and basically, you know, have end to end product lifecycle management all in these product families. So mm -hmm. we think there's another iteration to go even further down this path. But okay. yeah, it really works for us. I mean, the, the only downside you'll get is it, it's a leap of faith for the CFO, particularly, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm saying you have to allocate, we have to allocate <laughs> capital into these teams on a half yearly basis, and then we'll review outcomes at the half year point. You know, that's a leap of faith, and you need to have a decent relationship across the executive board to, to do it. But, um, is, is well worth the while. And so how the, in that model, how, because you're, it's an old company, it has been around for quite some time, so there must be tons of, of legacy there as well. well how do you manage yeah. legacy in, 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 in a model like that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we have, I mean, we're 150 years old. I'm pleased to say <laughs> some of the technology isn't 150 years old, but we've got 30 year old technology, you know, in our supply yeah. chain area particularly, you know, you think mm -hmm. of the core of a retail business is, is moving, buying and moving, you know, product. So, yeah, some very old technology. And actually, I think this model helps because I think, you know, a project-based model tends to always force you down the path of, the, of, of features, new, new things, new capability, the next thing the business wants. And, of mm -hmm. course, if you're not very, you know, if you're not very disciplined, you, that's a great way to build legacy and build complexity. Yeah. Um, Whereas what we're saying is in this product family, you have responsibility for tech debt, for, for legacy, for the cost of ownership, for the feature building, for experimentation. And you have to find the balance. You, know, you have to mm -hmm. find the balance. So actually, I think it drags that legacy problem out of IT ownership and firmly into a partnership ownership with the business. And that's good. You know, I think I've worked a lot of places where the, even the cost of that legacy is not clear. It's not clear enough to the business and therefore no. it gets overlooked. So mm -hmm. I think this model really works because it, it, it you know, it sheds, sheds light on a problem that technology owns if, if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about cloud for a moment. What is, what is your current state on, on cloud, open hybrid cloud, and what's your vision and strategy um, uh, for the coming years on cloud? Yeah, I mean, we've been a sort of cloud first business for, for three or four years now. So our default delivery consumption model, if you like, would be cloud-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've, you know, we've successfully deployed many new applications and services into the cloud. So we've transformed our HR, our back office HR world, it's all cloud-based. We've, we've taken our e-commerce engines for both brands, both main retail brands, and we've taken them to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So we're very much a cloud-first business. Um, hybrid cloud, I think like most people, you know, we're you know, one of the sh probably one of the few retailers you do work with AWS with Amazon, and uh, <laughs> which is some people are surprised about. I'm sure we'll talk yeah. about that. But you know, we we very much see cloud-based consumption model as as the way forward. Software mm -hmm. as a service when we can, uh, and and we're just you know we're we're sort of halfway through. I would say taking all of our estates and 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 putting them in the cloud. You know, we're running a, a big data center consolidation right now that will that will take us further. So you know, we're well on the way, but. Default would be to, to work in the cloud now. And you, you think you'll arrive at 100% cloud and you, where you can close your data centers? Uh, yeah, I think we will eventually. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not all data centers, and we'll probably always want to have some degree of on-premise 
uh, hybrid on premise for for certain reasons. But mm -hmm. I'd like to think there's there's very little that we wouldn't ultimately end up working in the cloud. You know, we've even managed to take some of that thirty year old supply chain legacy and and and, and take it to the cloud as well, just to give us capacity and, and, and growth potential. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, we're deep in a process and system transformation around supply chain logistics at the moment. Yeah. Um, again, cloud-based, you know, a lot of machine learning and algorithmic um, calculation opportunity in those so solutions as well. Yep. So, yeah, maybe not 100%, and, and I'm sure it, it's beyond my tenure of getting there as well. It'll take some time, but mm -hmm. I think we're, um, we're, we're on in shape to get virtually yep. everything into the cloud, yeah. And I understand you, you have a multi-cloud strategy, so you work and with AWS, Azure, Google. How do you decide what do you put where and, and how, do you, how, how do you do this uh, multi-cloud? How do you make sure that you're not vendor dependent on, on, on the cloud vendor? Yeah, we, we've got some way to go, I think, in terms of vendor dependence and making sure that we mm -hmm. give ourselves the real flexibility that I think everybody wants. Uh, but we're a, we're a big Amazon partner. We, you know, we made a choice before my time at the business, we had a choice to, to, to partner with AWS, and I have to say they've been mm -hmm. a very good partner for us. It's a question I get asked probably a lot. Yeah, uh, you're, you're feeding the enemy, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, but we've, we, you know, we genuinely found them, three years ago, we genuinely found them to be ahead in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and because we were one of the few retailers who were prepared to partner, I think we got some, you know, some really good uh, okay. partnership from them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've been working hard to try and level the playing field, uh, working hard with Microsoft uh, for Azure. And we've worked, we've done some interesting stuff with, with, with GCP, with Google as well, mm -hmm. um, particularly around data-driven analytics-based use cases. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, it's kind of workload-driven a bit. You know, I think we've been, we have had a, a major movement to, to leverage AWS. And then we can see real specific use cases for using Azure, and we're trying to level the playing field a little bit to give us more flexibility. Yeah. And then recently, doing more and more analytics and more and more sort of machine-based learning and, and AI-type um, use cases, we we found a use for GCP as well. So I think over time we'll, we'll end up with a with a clear multi-cloud you know deployment, and then some work to do I think in terms of the capabilities to to really give us that hybrid yeah. flexibility. So you're sitting on, on heaps of customer data. I mean, you have more data than, than you want maybe. So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of value in there. So how, do you, how far are you? How mature is the organization in, in getting the uh, most out of that customer data using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on? Well, it's been, it's been probably the biggest focus area for me for the last three years. You know, we decided... You know, this is a business that has a lot of data, as you say. You know, with mm -hmm. 30 million people shopping in our shops or online, you know, we're the second biggest general merchandise online retailer. I think the second, you know, one of the top online sites visited every every day. We have we have Nectar, which is an incredible, useful asset in terms of it. it it's an affiliated an affiliation loyalty program. So we work with other okay. brands, and, mm -hmm. and then we have a bank as well. So when you when you connect all that data up, we 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 recognised three or four years ago that actually the core differentiation of our business was in understanding our customers better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we, we took a decision three years ago, and I think when I first arrived, that said actually we really needed to, you know, to connect the data and democratize the data. So we ended up building a new ecosystem really for data. We call it Aspire. But basically we sort of lifted the data out of its source systems and we've, we've been through a process of curating it and connecting it into this new platform. And it's a, it's a mm -hmm. multi-product platform, Snowflake in the cloud as a, as a core warehouse engine. Yeah. And that's been transformational for us um, already. You know, and we're still kind of, you know, we're still decommissioning all the legacy. But mm -hmm. what it's done is it's, it's democratized data. It's taken data out of our commercial business, our supply chain engines, our retail. And really, we can start to see the business in a completely different light. You know, almost a digital oh. twin of the whole business. Okay. And then we've, we've been systemically looking for decisions we can re-engineer. So re replen is a great example. You know, we... A huge amount of labor, as you might, as you'll know, is in restocking a shop. You know, we have yep. fourteen hundred shops. So, um, and I, I like this example, Andrew, because I think if you can use machine learning in this example, you can use it anywhere. But so we basically we knew we had store specific planograms. So we had a you know a, a digital view of all the stores, mm -hmm. and we know how the, the the cages are packed from when they come out of a depot. And we basically added a machine learning algorithm that said, tell the colleague what's the simplest way to walk the floor in the store when they replen? And okay. it's just a really simple machine learning algorithm that says, I know mm -hmm. the store specific, I know the delivery, and you can, we've reduced walk time 
you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of walk time. Mm -hmm. and I think if you can use machine learning to, re, to restock a shop, you can use it anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So could you give an example how you'd use um, these advanced technologies and artificial intelligence and, and so on for, the, for your customer data? How, how um, were you able to serve the customer better because, yeah. because you're analyzing all the data? Yeah, I mean, personalization is the obvious example. You know, we, we really mm -hmm. strive. And it's a, we, we, you know, it's a big issue for us because we're a business that puts a lot of emphasis on trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having a trusted relationship with our customers, you know, 30 million of our customers choose to shop with us. I think we, we're really careful we don't do anything that, would, that could destroy that trust. But I think yeah. when, we, when you think about using data to personalize, we mm -hmm. have an awful lot of data about customers' choices, preference, shopping behavior, location. And what we're trying to do is really serve that up to them and help them make better choices and get better value. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, promoting certain products, promoting certain products at a certain price for individual customers, doing that at a point in time, either in the calendar month or at when they're in a physical place, mm -hmm. really serving that up to them so that it's a personalized service and offer is is you know, all retailers are looking for that because it's a, it's a little bit of, of magic in terms of, you yep. know, it's a very low margin business. If you can, if we can get customers to buy one more product in their basket, you can change the economics of the business. And the best way to get a customer to buy it is to give them value when they really want it or when they really yep. need it. So an example would be, you know, I know you buy toothpaste every third week of the month or, um, and you, if you, it's not in your basket. If I know you're going into the store, or you're even better, if you're walking past the toothpaste, can I nudge you to say, here's a value, here's an offer? And yep. that, that sort of, you know, making the personalization useful and valuable to the customer is, is the sweet spot we're aiming for. And, and that's, all, that's all analytics, and it's all, it's all data science. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about technology, because we love to talk about technology. So... Um, um, what is the, 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 your strategy around open source? Is that a big thing? Do you use a lot of open source tools and platforms for, uh, for your teams? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean we've worked, again, we've worked hard to become an engineering business again. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we, you know I have 1,600 people in the organization and, you know, probably 800 engineers. So, you wow. know, we, we do a lot of development, a lot of engineering mm -hmm. and, and we do it because we feel it gives us the agility and, and, the, and the speed and the, and the sensitivity that we really yep. need. Now, you know, with a very strong engineering culture, there's a very strong drive towards open source, uh, you know, for all the reasons that all, you know, the listeners will all know in the sense of it, mm -hmm. you know, it gives us a potential to, to break some of the big license, you know, monoliths we have. And, but also it really gives us an opportunity to, to engineer, you know, beautiful solutions and contribute back into, into the community as well. So a good example would be, you know, e-commerce in one of our, you know, retail brands, we've, mm -hmm. we've effectively built virtually the end-to-end the, the end -to -end e e-commerce solution is an open source, is based on open source. So yeah, it's a big deal for us. I mean, we obviously are a, you know, a build-by organization, so it's a combination of approaches. But when yep. we engineer, if we can engineer and can build, uh, looking to build an open source wherever possible is very much high on our on our sort of design principles, yeah. Okay. So we talked about cloud, we talked about open source, we, we talked about artificial intelligence and, and, and tools, different uh, technology stacks, let's say. Do you see other domains, other areas of technology that are new and exciting uh, for the use in your business? Yeah, I mean, I think you've, you've touched on the important ones, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and, we're, and we're still very early days, I think, in really exploiting that. And I think mm -hmm. the technology is far in advance of the business's readiness to accept it and uh, you know still i think what we can do with data science i think is already beyond what the business's ability to really understand yep. how to, to get maximum value from it so there's a bit of catching up i think or we need to keep it in parallel i think mm -hmm. but the one area i suppose for a retailer we're all really interested in is is in imaging in video and, and video okay. analytics you know that we know there's a paradigm shift coming at some point uh, in a retail business away from barcodes and, and scanning and, you know, and we've seen a little bit with, with Amazon in the US, but, you know, can we, you know, when, when it's affordable and when it's a practical thing to do, can we make the shopping experience 
even more seamless and intuitive by yep. by relying more heavily on video analytics. So I'm really excited about you know the combination of of, of cloud analytics and data and video because yep. I think when we, we can start to create fundamentally different customer experiences. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and we've, you know, and a little bit, we've played a little bit with augmented reality and virtual reality, particularly on our general merchandise business. You can go on there and you can select a television and put it on the wall in your house, or you can put a okay. sofa in your front room. So we've played a little bit with, with augmented reality, but I suspect that's another area where, you know, the shopping experience becomes a lot more immersive, will blur the boundaries between real and augmented yeah. reality. And, and I think, you know, those combination of those two make me really excited for customer experience for the future. So how long do you think it will take you and, and the organization to come up with a system where I can just come into a Sainsbury, take whatever I want and just walk out without, without needing to, to pay and ev everything goes automatically? Well, I think we're always going to want you to pay. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> but no, I mean, watch this space. Watch this space. We're, uh -huh. you know, that's, um, you know, we, we, we have that already. I mean, in the sense that we launched last year, we had a pilot store right next to our headquarters in London where you basically could, you could walk in, scan yourself and just pay on your phone and yep. walk out. And um, interestingly, it was, it, wasn't, it, was, it was a difficult thing for customers to enjoy because, um, you know, we found that, you know, a lot of our customers didn't enjoy just walking out of the shop, not having, I not not having, having a conversation. A transaction. And yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. And I think one of the challenges for our business is, you know, it's it's not a one size fits all. You know, I mean, you no. know, we have, you know, self service and self scanning, and and we will we will have walking out. I'm sure in the near term, but we also serve 30 million customers that range from, you know, 15 year old children to 85 year old adults, yep. and they want to shop differently and they have different expectations and you know we need to always bear that in mind you know so we'll we'll introduce it in a really progressive way but yeah watch this space we're not far from what you're describing okay great looking forward to that so Sainsbury is and and, and the group is a huge company i i understand there's about 180,000 people that work in the, in the company and you have uh, 1600 people in 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 IT and digital so how do you organize 1,600 and peop 1600 people to serve the, com uh, the company and, and, and build the products necessary to do the, the transformation that you're going through? Yeah, I mean, 1,600 of our colleagues and then many thousands in our, in our partners as well, as you okay, say, it's a yeah. big ecosystem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm organi we organize, and, we, and we've just ch we're just changing the organization, but I, I now have two CTO organizations that do the engineering and or now do mm -hmm. the, the, the full lifecycle application development and management yeah one one faces the customer so one's customer and data so that so we put everything that the customer can touch and feel is engineered by by one organization and then we have one organization that faces the business so it's colleagues mm -hmm. suppliers and, op and the business operations so and that really works for us because we're driving so much connected end-to-end -end change that having a customer focus and a colleague focus it, yep. it's quite powerful so two CTO organizations do that obviously the the bulk of the organization sits there I have mm -hmm. a platform engineering and service organization so we do a lot of our own platform engineering to uh, you know environments that, that, that these two engineering functions will develop on mm -hmm. so platform engineering and service so we've combined infrastructure and service operations and platform together so that organization two CTOs and then I have um, a CISO organization, data security and data governance. Yeah. Uh, and then I have one organization that helps me manage and transform technology. And typically it, does, it manages all our partnerships. So it does program management, it does supplier management, it does colleague yeah. experience, you know, and it does a, a raft of things really close to me and, and works with me on driving change. So it's a pretty tight organization, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but broadly speaking, big engineering functions, big operations and platform, CISO and then and then this, well, we call it TBM, but it's, it manages yeah. all our relationships. Yeah. And what is fundamentally your role in, in, in the company? Because you've, you've made your life simple. You have four or five teams, four or five people to manage, but <laughs> I'm just joking. But what is, <laughs> what is really your role? What is the fundamental yeah. value that and, and, and the, the added value that you bring to the company? My, my role is chief transformation officer. It's, it's a leader of change at the business level. So I mean, I you know I you know I, storytelling and change is what I do. I mean, I think my job is to is to create the impetus for change, deliver great change, 
create momentum for change by really, mm -hmm. you know, by storytelling. And I, and I, I big believe that's the role of, of CIOs. I think if, if you're a CIO and you're not, you, if you're not at the forefront of business change, then you probably, you know, haven't got position quite right where you need to be. Yeah. So I spend, I, you know, I now am, I'm in th my third year of the role. So the team's pretty well set up. We've been through a few organizational iterations and the one I describe is relatively new. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that is to free me up to to play that role across the exec yep. team and to lead change. And uh, and I increasingly have more accountability outside of technology for change uh, in the business because I think you know it, a it suits my leadership personality, but also I think technology is a core differentiator and mm -hmm. and a driver of change, particularly now, particularly coming off the back of COVID. Um, it's never been, there's never been a better time, I think, to be a technologist and lead change than right yeah. now, because I think, um, you know, like I say, the stars are aligned, I think. Yeah. So the role of the CIO has changed already many times during your career. And, and, yeah. and every now and again, they say, well, this role will disappear. So what's your view on this? Is, is, are we going to always going to need a, a CIO, CTO, CTO role, or is technology really going to fuse with the business and everybody will will play that role. What's, the, what's your vision on that? No, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, no, I, I think we'll always, you'll always have a leader around the table of a board who should have, who's, who's, who's leading on change and enabled that by technology. I actually mm -hmm. think we're going to see CEOs come from the CIO, CTO family. I think we're going to see more businesses be led by, by career technologists because I think, okay. you know, I think it's, you know, I, I've said this a lot to my business counterparts, you know, I, I have lived through an era of it was a system of record. It was a system of engagement for a while. It always felt like a cost to serve part of the operations, yep. you know. Um, but now technology is the business. You know, yep. for for a retail company, technology is the a core differentiator. Whether that's knowing your customers better through analytics yep. or fantastic online digital services, you know, or great logistics. No. Nothing works without great technology, right? And I, and, I, and we're 180,000 people, as you said. So, but we genuinely believe the real sweet spot for us is putting great technology in the hands of great people. No. So, I don't think we're you know a business that will will you know will not have any people in it, or will you know I'm sure we'll get more efficient and effective over time with the number of people no. we have. But that combination of great technology, great people, we think is the real recipe for great customer experience. No. So, yeah, I. I Definitely think CTOs, CIOs on the boards of businesses, no, no risk there. I think some of the other yep. jobs, like the, the data jobs and the, perhaps the digital offices, they do feel quite transient from, to me. I suspect we'll, we'll see chief data officers, chief digital officers, you know, that will, disappear, that will yeah. roll back into CTO yep. and CIO over time, I suspect. Okay. But yeah. So I'm sure you're having a ball at Sainsbury, but do you see yourself maybe in the future then as, as a CEO of, of company and uh, like... <laughs> Is, is that is that your ambition, your your vision for the no, future? No, I don't think not for me. Not for me. I I mean I'm you know I'm probably too old now, Andrew, if I'm honest. But uh, <laughs> no, I I think um, you know I, I I it's change and transformation that really attracts me, and that and mm -hmm. technology is the best place to work. And I I think there's lots to do in many many oh. businesses. So no, I think for me it's more of the, I'll eventually finish my executive career, and then I think you know going off and working with a, a number of companies and helping. Oh drive change through maybe non-exec or other ways will probably be yeah. in the future. You already, you already do that today, being a non-exec in, in companies, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm very privileged to have had a number of opportunities. Yeah, I worked with um, HSBC for a year, and then I, I've been a, a, on the board of TalkTalk, Talk, which is a, uh -huh. a broadband uh, telecoms business here in the UK. And that's great. And that's great. And I, I find that's really valuable for me. It's a bit of a mm -hmm. decompression as well. It's an opportunity to you know, go and have a non-exec conversation where I don't necessarily own the answer, but I can be part of the solution. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I bring a lot back into our business, you know, of, of, you know, particularly being part of the audit and risk committee in another business. It, it's very useful to build, I think, leadership skill. Yeah. yeah. I think more and more CIOs in the future will become non-executive non directors or will need to become more non-executive directors. Yeah. Not too many already do that today, but I, I think I'm sure that will... That will grow in the future, and 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 like you said, it's it gives you a lot of extra business ac acumen and, and 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 knowledge that you can bring back to the organization. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I yeah. I mean, I always say the same. I think I would always encourage businesses to think hard about having technology expertise on their board, um, yeah. particularly digital data and security. I think those three dimensions, 
you know, I think boards are, it's, it's changed, right? In my time as a CIO, boards are a lot more savvy than they used to be yeah. in all those three areas. But no, I agree with you. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for, for CIOs to start taking key NED roles and really yeah. help other boards exploit technology. And I just think that's part of that journey. I'm sure chair, chair people will start to see that contribution. And yeah. I think that will convert into, into CEOs as well in the future. Yeah. So, you, you, I mean, you have these 1,600 people that you work with. How do you manage that? What is your, what's your management style? Uh, how do you make sure that they're, they're successful? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I'm a, I suppose my mantra would be, I'm, I'm just a big believer in transparency and honesty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I, I think, I, I'd like to think they'd all say I'm pretty direct, pretty open, transparent. I'm a fundamental belief that transparency drives speed in a business. I've worked in many different cultures. And I think there's a direct correlation between the degree of transparency you have and how fast you make decisions. You know, businesses that are shrouded and too political and too hierarchical tend to make very slow decisions. Um, businesses that are really quick to identify a problem or an opportunity and, and really open and honest and transparent usually make decisions really quickly. So I, I like to run my organization like that. I like to, you mm -hmm. know, you know, and actually COVID in a funny sort of way has been great for that because you know, I do a Monday huddle on a, you know, with everyone, 1,600 mm -hmm. people every Monday. And even though I've, we've all been physically remote for six months, I'm sure many businesses are like this, we've had engagement go through the, through the roof. We were eight, eight percentage points up this year alone in, in sustainable yep. engagement for our colleagues because there's something very um, personal about this sort of interface, right? And, yep. uh, and there's also something very democratizing about everybody accessing something the same way. So actually, it's been great for me as a leader to be able to reach out and talk to all the 1,600. But I, I try and do it in a, you know, talk, talk very so you, clearly. So and every Monday you talk to your, directly to the 1,600 people at the same time? Every Monday. Wow. And we do, we call it a huddle, but we, we have a, there's a pulse in the morning, which is basically, it's a retailer, right? So everybody wants to know what's happened at the weekend and what's happening next week. And, mm -hmm. and, and every single Monday, we, we, we pulse in the morning, which is the executive team and, and lots of other people. And then we huddle every Monday to ensure that everybody in the company has a perspective on how did we trade, what's happening next week, what's, what's important. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, it's one of those Sainsbury's things that works brilliantly. And um, okay. so, yeah, every Monday I'll have a... And, of course, we used to do that through a cascade, a physical cascade before mm -hmm. COVID. Yep. And, I, and I think we felt that was effective. Well, of course, we've realized in the last six months that actually me doing it on a Monday with everyone so they hear one message is far more effective. So yeah, every Monday um, I get to talk to them from my little study at home, yeah. Okay, so, so people, so all people in your teams, they all start to get to know you as well, better and better, yeah. because you talk to them on, on a weekly basis. So how do you think they perceive you as a leader? What do you think they will say about you when you're not around? Um, I think they probably would say I was I'm pretty tough. I think they'd probably say I'm pretty tough, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very honest. Um, a good example would be, you know, ways of working has been a real hot topic for us. You know, we've got everybody working from home as many, many large businesses for, since March. Yep. And our, my, my team have been clamoring for what's going to our future here? What's going to happen here? Are we, are we going to go back or not? And, yep. uh, and I've dealt with that question probably every week since March. And I committed to them that I would, I would tell them by the end of September what the plan was for the future. And we've mm -hmm. now gone ahead of the rest of the business in telling them because I said I would and we made that commitment. So I think they would say I was pretty informal, pretty tough, uh, but honest, pretty fair. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think probably someone who has influence in the business. I think, I think one of the things that I hear from them is Technology, we feel, we feel like we're on the front foot in the business. We feel like technology has a real voice around the table. We yep. feel like we're really driving change. Um, and that seems to resonate really well with them. I think that's what they'd say. Okay. Your personality profile that you shared with me is that you are the architect, the INTJ. Uh, so you're a bit more introvert. You see, you're intuitive. You see the big picture and, and patterns. More rational than emotional and, and more judging than perceiving. Uh, and, and people with INTJ profiles, typically their strengths are that, that they're rational, which is clear. They're well-informed, they're independent, de determined, so they're driven by facts and figures and not by, uh, by hierarchy or, or by uh, authority. And they're curious and versatile. Does that fit the bill? Does that, you, you recognize yourself in that? 
Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I, it's, I'm always amazed by MBTI because it always <laughs> you know you think you're a complex individual, but actually, yeah, that's a good summary. And I think it's one of the reasons I like change, or I you know I've been successful. I think probably at leading change is because mm-hmm. I am determined. I'm curious. I enjoy the application of technology into businesses probably more than the technology itself. So yeah. I mean, my curiosity lends itself to understanding the business well. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and I'm pretty resilient and you have to be resilient, right? I mean, I, yeah. when you're driving change in a business, it can be lonely at times and it can be mm-hmm. a, a difficult job. Um, so yeah, I think that describes me pretty well. And I, I mean, I, you know, I've, uh, I'm, you know I'm a, I think people would be surprised if they, people who know me at work would be surprised with the I. Yeah, uh, how, how can an introvert be a leader like that? That's the big question. Well, no? because I think it's about where you get your energy from, right? And I, mm-hmm. I, it's a learned behavior for me to to lead large teams. And I, you know, okay. like like all of us, I've, you know, you, you can do all of the things, can't you? It just takes more energy. Yeah. And for me, uh, I am an I because I, you know, I know to protect myself and to re-energize myself. You know, there are things I need to do, and it usually isn't involving other people. So there is an element of I need that space for myself, um, and that's why working, you know, in the way we've been working for the last six months has suited me. Actually, I mean, it, it, you know, I've, I've been very engaged as we were talking about, but actually, the, 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 the sheer nature of me being at home, I found actually my energy levels have been much better. Okay. And so how do you re- the eye? Yeah. yeah. And and how do you relax? How how do you get back to your, your yourself? How do you digest uh, the, the business problems and, and so on? So how, how do you, yeah, how do, how do you relax, Phil? Well, I mean, I'm a, like, I feel like many of I have a very busy family life. So when I, mm-hmm. when I leave my office, you know, I don't get a lot of time to think about anything else other than <laughs> what's happening in the house. I have three children and, and married to Claire with three great kids. Mm-hmm. All, all at you know, 20, 17 and 12, so all different times of their life. So I, I put a lot of energy into them and I find yep. that, to be quite relaxing so I do a lot of taxi driving at the weekends I'm <laughs> you know we live very remote in a very remote part of the UK so you know we made a commitment to the kids that we wanted to live yep. there but we would always make sure that we could get them where they needed to be so I do spend a lot of time driving them around but I love sport and I you know, and I like nothing more than to in, in, immerse myself in a sporting occasion I was 50 a couple of years ago I went down to Australia and watched five days of, an, of a cricket match in a row with my best friend who's Australian. Yeah. So um, well, that would be perfect British for me. British thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Five days but, um, of cricket. Five days in a row we sat there and had a thoroughly good time. So I suppose in a combination of family life and, and sport and, and friends, you know, like normal, okay. that, would be, that would be how I relax. So how old are your kids and what are the, what are the values that you pass on to your kids? So what, what do you think is important for them to be happy and successful in life? Yeah, I got, I've got three. I've got a son, Joe, who's nearly 20, uh, mm-hmm. who's off to university next week, uh, which is a big mm-hmm. moment for us. Uh, yeah. And I have a daughter, Eleanor, who's 17 in, in a two weeks' time, so just starting to drive and, and starting her life. And then I have a little one, Olivia, who's, who's 12. Um, look, I think the values we try and instill in them is, you know, honesty and integrity beyond anything else and mm-hmm. hard work. Um, and they all have a similar set of values to Claire and I, and as so much I think we all we all have a very strong sense of justice and fairness. Mm-hmm. Nothing irritates us more, all of us actually, than something that feels like it's not fair. So fairness, hard work, integrity, honesty, all the things I think we try and engender in our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and they're they're yeah, they're fantastic. They're a life's work and I'm very proud of them. Okay, great. So in your in your professional life or personal life as well, I'm sure there were uh, people that you look up to, people that l- learned you a lot of things, mentors in your life. Can you, did you have good mentors and could you give an example? Yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky. I mean, on the journey through leadership, you work with some great and some not so great leaders, don't you? And I think you learn. <laughs> and you learn you from learn. both. <laughs> you do, you really do, yeah. Um, and I worked, I was very, very lucky. I worked for a lady called Jenny Mundy when I was at Vodafone. She was CTO at Vodafone. And mm-hmm. she was, and she still is, she's MD at, in, somewhere in Barclay Card now. But um, she was the, the first, I think, and the best values-based leader I ever worked with and for. You know, she put her values and the values she wanted to create in the team almost beyond everything else, which mm-hmm. meant she took a lot of pressure, but she always created an environment for others to really to, to go on and succeed. And, and we created, she created a really high performing team at Vodafone when I was part of that. And mm-hmm. it's interesting how many of us have gone on to do, you know, very big jobs, you know, all across the world. And that's mm-hmm. something about the way Jenny led. Um, and, and, I, and that was inspirational to me. And I, 
I've been striving ever since to try and run high performing teams like like Jenny ran the one I was in. And, you know, I think when you've been in a high performing team, genuinely no. in a team that is 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 joined on intent, deals, you know, has constructive conflict, you know, no. t- challenges the issue, not the person, you know, really it, it's incredible. It's incredible. And I've been, you know, and I've, got, I've come close a few times with my own teams, but probably never <laughs> quite got there. So I, I hold Jenny up as probably my, she's my North Star in terms of leadership. Um, you know, and it's great. That it, she's a woman. It's great to, in a technology context to learn that from yeah. a woman. And there's a lesson for all of us there, I think. Exceptional. Yeah. Okay. So in your 30 years career, what was in, in what would you perceive as, the, as one of the best things that ever happened to you? And, and, and can you share that? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, making the decision to go and work overseas. I've, I've had two stints overseas in my career. Okay. I spent, in Vodafone, I spent time in Kenya. We did a startup called Safaricom. In Kenya? Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. And that so cool. I was part of the team that, that, that created Safaricom, which is, I think, now the biggest company in Kenya, actually. But it's a mobile operator in okay. Kenya. Um, mm-hmm. And then late, later on, I went, obviously, I went from Vodafone to Telefonica and then ended up in Madrid running, mm-hmm. uh, running tele, you know, Telefonica technology. And uh, I think the, the two choices to work overseas uh, have been career defining and life defining a little bit for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I loved, I loved the, the, the shift of context. I love the challenge of cultural diversity. I love the challenge of de- trying to deal with it in a language context. But really, I love you know, thinking about how I lead and, and how's that got to change in the context mm-hmm. of 20 countries where I don't speak the language and, you know, I don't understand the politics. And, and, and I just love that. Um, no. And I've grown probably more from that experience as a leader than any other. Both of them, actually. Kenya was very early on in my leadership journey mm-hmm. and Telefonica, obviously, more recently. You know, and then combining that, you know, eight years I was in Telefonica and you know, four years I had the family out there and I commuted the rest, you know. So okay. for all of us, it, it's, it, you know, I'm sure for all of us, it's been life-changing, that experience. And you enjoyed life in Madrid then? I loved life in Madrid, yeah. It was yeah. a fabulous place to be and a fabulous place to have children, actually. Spanish okay. have, a very, have a very, you know, cool work-life, you know, perspective on things, you know. And, yeah. uh, you know, when I went there as well, you know, it was, I, the, the average tenure in the role was about 18, 19 months in, in the role I was going into. Only, wow. So I said to Claire, you know, let's go. You know, there's a good chance I'll get fired in a couple of years and we'll be back, you know. And after eight years and I had to make my own choice to leave, you know, I knew, I knew I'd done some things right, clearly. But it was mm-hmm. a real wrench to leave Spain. Yeah, the, I had, my little one was fluent in Spanish and more Spanish okay. and English by then. So, yeah, it was a real wow. wrench, but I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> okay. So, and, and in this 30 years, you had a lot of good experiences, but I'm sure there were also some, some things that didn't really go as you wanted it. So, let's, <laughs> let's rephrase the question. What was your most brilliant mistake, your most brilliant failure, let's say, that you ever made in, in business? Uh, and, and, well, and what did you learn from it? How did you cope with that and what did you learn from that? Yeah, like, like any IT professional, I can point to three or four <laughs> major initiatives that haven't gone well, haven't delivered mm-hmm. the value, you know, have been failures. Um, I think I'm getting better at spotting those. I mean, I, mm-hmm. you know, they, I, I don't feel like I've had one of those for 10 or 15 years. But, you know, so I think when I think about failure, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to look beyond, you know, big investments that just have run off the rails and not delivered for, for, mm-hmm. for all the reasons that everybody will know. Um, yeah. And I've got better, I think, at, you know, I got better at sniffing out and, and, and feeling as well as seeing and reading and hearing when things aren't right. Um, but yeah, those would be my, the, the, the worst point in my career, I, I guess, mm-hmm. was I, I ended up leaving Vodafone because I, I, I felt very strongly that the culture of the business or the culture of some of the individuals in the business wasn't for me. It was a very sort of strong um, uh, decision taken to sort of transform Vodafone UK at the time. And, and actually the behaviours and the cultures that came along with that just didn't sit with me very well. You know, I just felt it was, you know, it was unpleasant. And I yeah. decided that that wasn't for me. And I, I walked away. And, um, you know, that was a tough decision. You know, yeah. I had to tell Claire that I'm, I'm going to leave and I don't know what I'm going to be doing next. And... But I did it because I felt, you know, it was one of those times where I, the, the, the business, some people in the business have crossed over a, a, a cultural and a values line yeah. for me. And I, but, what, but having said that, walking away and then looking back on it, it's probably the, one of the proudest things I've done is, 
is to stand up for what I believed in, you know. Yeah. So you had your fair uh, share of, of uh, in early on in your career of, of failures and learn from that. So, so I'm, and you say it's, uh, you have that less now. So that means that you're, you, you know how to read the signs of things that go um, pear-shaped. So you, you, <laughs> you need to decide to let things fail quickly. And, and if there's, so what are the signs? How do you, if you see projects in, uh, around you going in the wrong direction, how do you sense that quickly? What, what, and, uh, yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're always on the lookout for the same things, right? I mean, typically it's about the degree of business engagement and business ownership. Okay. You know, which is, you know, absolutely classic yeah. <laughs> failure, uh, lead indicator of failure. There's, again, that transparency around, you know, an expectation. So expectation management. Is this thing over-promising or, you know, you know, so is there levels of engagement, levels of ownership? Are we over it? Are we over-expecting? Are we, are we, are we, have we fooled ourselves into a business case or a, an investment case? Are we, are we being overly, you know, unrealistic? Um, if you then listen to your teams, my teams, I, they'll, they'll tell you. They might not tell you in a very direct way at times, but the mm -hmm. signs will be there. You know, there'll be, there'll be issues and tensions around the interfaces of, a, of teams. And so I think when you, you know, when you really get and have been around the block a bit, I think you get a yep. sense of, the recipe's not right here. And I think it feels mm -hmm. like it's like that. You know, there's, you need a load of ingredients. You need to get the recipe right for change to happen. Um, and I think you get a strong sense when the recipe's not quite right. You know, and, and it's, like I said, I think it's usually centers around business engagement. One of the reasons mm -hmm. in Telefonica that we did a 20 country transformation, if I'm being honest, was, was it was we needed to go big to get the business to really understand the scale of change. So we could have tried to perhaps have a you know a lower risk profile implementation. What we did was re redeploy the entire full mm -hmm. stack of um, billing and CRM and everything else. And um, that wouldn't have been my first choice, I think, technically. But this, this ownership issue was a problem. So mm -hmm. by making it profoundly a business model question, the yep. CEOs in all the countries couldn't ignore it. So they had to grab it and own it and run with it. And that was yep. our biggest, that was probably one of the biggest things we did to really move those projects on. So I think, yeah, I think you, there's no secret sauce here, Andrew. I think you experienced people all through technology will know the signs. Yep. It's being able to join the dots and then being brave enough to call it out, I think is important. Yep. So when, when do you feel happy at work in your, in your professional life? When, what is it that drives you? When at the end of the day, when you close your, your laptop, you say, well, this was really a great day. What, what must have happened to, to give you that feeling? Well, I love to win. Mm -hmm. I love to win. I'm very competitive. So if I feel like, you know, there's been an issue or a question or a piece of strategy that I've, I've felt passionate about and, we've, and I've managed to influence what I think is the right outcome, yep. I love that. I love that. And okay. I feel like that's me doing my job. Um, but, you know, but also, you know, it's great, it's great to, to cheer on success as well, right? I think when mm -hmm. we get, when we deliver something and when, when something happens, it doesn't matter how small, it's yeah. great to be part of that recognition process. So I love, I love that. And actually, you know, it's one of those things that you, you learn, don't you, as, a, as an executive, uh, you cast a long shadow. So finding the time to just pick out someone and and, and call out their deliverable, their, their contribution, mm -hmm. you know, actually it really has an impact. So, so I suppose it ranges from those two ends of the spectrum, you know, oh. can I influence around the board table something I think we need to do? And if I can, makes me feel great. Right down through to, can I pick out an individual at times and just tap them on the shoulder and say, I can see what you've done. I know the contribution you've made, thank you. Oh, um, that makes me feel good. So, People watching this video, um, some of them will have the ambition to become a top uh, digital leader uh, like you are and, and build a success as, as a CIO as, uh, as you have. What would your advice be to those people that have the ambition to, to be in your shoes one day? See, I think you, my advice would be make sure you know the business as well as everybody else does around that board mm -hmm. table. So actually, I think it's, a le it's less about technology and much more about the application of it in your business. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that, you know, you'll build a team to run technology, you'll great get, create and get great technologists around you. 
the mm -hmm. real the real emphasis or the real thing that boards are looking for from CIOs is is an understanding of the business, a, a, you know, a good enough understanding of the business that you can apply technology and you can be the trusted, you know, advisor on change. And and I think if you're if you're too steeped in the technology and you and you haven't quite got the context, yeah. you'll find there's going to be a ceiling. You're not going to get there. So to, I think to get to CXO, it's a business leadership role. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're the technologist, but it's a business leadership role. And then once you get that position, you know, you've got technology and the business understanding. Well, the world's your oyster. I think you can really drive change. But yeah. I, I see a lot of up and coming sort of senior managers who have come from technical backgrounds. They, they lead engineering functions and, and they just don't seem to be able to break through. And I think it's because I think people miss the fact that it's a business leadership role. Mm -hmm. So that'd be my advice. Be, yeah. be, be you know, immerse yourself and, you know, obviously in doing so, build great relationships, but know the business as well as anybody. That's what you need to do. Okay. Let's finish off with um, um, what you are most grateful for in your life. I mean, you had a very successful life, ups and downs, I'm sure. But what is it that you are most grateful for and in, in, in what you have achieved over that, what happened around you? Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's my family, definitely. I mean, I, you know, my father died when I was three. Uh, so I had a, I was okay. growing up, you know, I had three brothers and, you know, my mum did an incredible job with us and she passed away last year. And uh, so, you know, my own family, you know, I'm driven by, in a way I'm driven by wanting her, to, you know, always felt I wanted her to feel like, you know, all the sacrifices she had made were worthwhile. Um, and then I would have my own family. I realised that I'm very, very driven to give them, you know, to give them like we, I think all parents do, to give them as much as I can um, mm -hmm. of love and, um, and you know, uh, opportunity really. So uh, that's what drives me. It still drives me to this day and I'm nearer to retirement than I am to start in my career, that's for <laughs> sure. And, uh, and, you know, the, the rest of my, you know, the rest of my life will be, will be immersed in, you know, what, you know, my own children and my own family and making sure that they've had, you know, the love they deserve and the opportunities that they crave, you know. Okay. On that great note, uh, I would like to thank you for the time and, and for your openness and uh, sharing all the, uh, the stories that you, uh, that you have. So I really enjoyed it, uh, Phil. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been great.